welcome to the modular clubhouse for today's very special presentation where we've got john mccoy aka sound unit with us uh so john first of all thank you so much for um well, for making time into your busy schedule for meeting with us. How have you been? How's today been? And now John disconnected. That is unfortunate. John, are you there? Hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to send every, anyone an invite to uh, get on stage. If anyone is willing to just uh, help me kill the time until we uh, get this sorted. Uh, John, uh, currently Discord is showing that you are muted, so you'll probably have to unmute yourself. Uh, in the meantime, yeah, well, uh, well. It's still not the worst. The worst uh, thing that happens. Hey Z4, how are you? Hey, ah, uh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, I'll help. I'll help you fill the air. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. Um, Where are you located, what, by the way? Oh, I'm. Uh, I'm uh, from uh, Northern Ireland, so I've got the Irish accent. So you can probably hear that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so uh, uh, so so where are you then? In, in, in Derry or something? Or. Oh no, that's that's up for the furthest north. I'm. Uh, I'm kind of near a place called uh, uh, Lisburn, it's called, which is about yeah. t 10 miles away from uh, uh, Belfast. So uh, mm -hmm. I, live in the, I live in County Antrim. Well, and I, uh, uh, I used to call Ireland my, my home away from home. So I, I used to live there part time, so to say, but that was all around Dublin. Oh, so I, um, it's always great to hear people uh, speak up with a proper uh iris accent so thank you so much for that Perfect. yeah no problem no problem yeah it's uh m modular uh is a is is a bit yes. of a here oh he's here Woo! that's john <laughs> i leave you to it. <laughs> yeah no worries so so, so what, what, what happened john? i had to pull out my ipad i don't know my phone was being a little bitch man God, mm. dang. but it's working right now oh i'm on my ipad now <laughs> so like, but even even the clarity the, the 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 audio clarity it has improved significantly as well. Okay. Oh, that shit was annoying. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wouldn't be a modular clubhouse meet uh, if we didn't have any sort of technical challenges. Uh so oh. don't don't you worry about that. No. And as Fuck. I said, John, it's 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 an honor and a privilege to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, it's and, nice being here. <laughs> and I just hope that this is uh, <laughs> finally <laughs> but again i do have to thank z4 for uh, for stepping in and just uh helping me well kill the time so to say um so well i've opened up the um the show and we're just gonna make sure that we have all of this interactivity ongoing uh we already had a well a good discussion on the companion channel uh, so as always if anyone has any questions in the meantime uh, you don't need to wait until we open it up for Q&A uh, but you can just post it in the companion channel in the meantime uh, and of course at the end once we've done the the full interview we're going to open it up for Q&A uh, so you can actually join us on stage and ask your questions uh, live uh, but now John as I said well the most important question is how have you been how's today been yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Today was good. Um, like I was saying, it was kind of busy at my other job, but um, mm -hmm. it, I kind of like it, so it's fun doing it. And um, so it, it was a pretty good day today. Uh, and um, yeah, I get to do this now. Perfect, perfect. Any plans yeah. after this, or is this uh, about as uh, well? My daughter is. Uh, she's a senior at. There's a local art school here in Myad, and mm -hmm. she has her senior thesis showing this week so i'm gonna go check out like there's an open gallery uh there at the school so i'm gonna go check out her uh her stuff oh wow um, she does like these like wood carving prints that are just really fucking badass um awesome i don't know what else uh yeah there we go with the cursing like we talked about but well yeah, and don't don't good. you worry don't you worry <laughs> do you have any links or pictures to uh to her work that you can share um yeah, where's my phone i can use my phone for that yeah yeah sure um yeah, I'll throw it up there. So, yeah, I'm just going to go hang out with her and see her artwork. And, yeah, that's about it. And come home and work on some modular music awesome. um, after that. 
And yeah. that's, of course, the main reason why we're talking, right, is talk yes. a, bit, a bit, bit more about what inspired you to, well, to take up modular and to, well, actually dive into being a modular artist. I've, as I said, I'll, I'll make sure to have these links in the description of the YouTube video going forward, but also in the in the podcast that we're going to be releasing. But the people who have joined have been exposed to your uh, music f through the companion channel already. So to get to that journey, so how did you actually get into music? What was your musical upbringing? Uh, anything that you were listening to uh, while growing up? Anything that really stood out and f uh, well, uh, formed you as an artist? Uh, yeah, a lot. I mean, well, I, I, I'm originally from New Orleans, so... Um, a little music there. Yeah, there's a lot of music there. We had the French Quarter. Uh, you know, even going down there with your parents, you're just... There's street musicians. You know, there's something always happening. So there's parades. I love the marching bands. Mm -hmm. um, I would... The, my favorite part of those were the drum lines. Um, so for percussion stuff that was an early influence it's like oh, wow. i would say that was an influence before you, you kind of even know you're being influenced by something mm -hmm. um it's one of those things um uh, saint augustine look them up on youtube they're the marching 100 best marching band just hands down they're just they're just amazing um i'm so, just gonna I look mean, them up immediately <laughs> um so yeah, just growing up around New Orleans and having that kind of music, you know, just being subjected to it. Um, I started playing piano around 10 years old um, and then got into guitar a little later. Um, and that's when I started doing, you know, bands and that's when grunge was out. So yeah. we were doing that kind of thing. Um, a little more stoner-ish type of stuff, but still kind of that grungy sound because... Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're then 16, we're then talking we yeah talking mid, early to mid nineties or yeah early nineties uh, I would say I mean yeah you know, I, I guess the first bands were in the late eighties but those were just like you know Dead Milkmen cover band type stuff like nothing yeah. else serious um, and then yeah yeah mid nineties was all that and then um, from there it kind of went into the more experimental stuff. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of a band called Mercury Rev, but um, mm. they ha they had their first two albums are really shoegazing. Like everyone talks about My Bloody Valentine, and I like My Bloody Valentine. They're cool and everything, but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's nothing that can compare to the first two Mercury Rev albums. They're just amazing. Um, so once I heard that stuff, that just put me on a just completely different tangent um, musically. And then um, that was going for a while with like just the guitar experimentation. And then right before I moved to Milwaukee in like 96, 97, uh, the German band Cluster was on tour. And I never heard them. And so I went to see them because I knew they were doing electronic stuff. And then <clears throat> that's when that was yet another tangent type thing that was mm -hmm. a size that was to me that was a seismic event when i saw that that show um i kind of put the guitar down and it was like it was all about synths and non-traditional instrumentation and um buying shortwave radios and using them to self-oscillate and um <laughs> you know and uh, it was it, you know it just really put me in a loop you know um using a lot more tape machines stuff like that um and then once I got out to Milwaukee, there was a, a there's a fairly good um, improvisation experimental scene here. And I, I felt like it was a, a little bit better here than New Orleans. Um, so mm -hmm. I fell in with some a good group of people once I got up here. And then you immediately were able to well, start to actually build upon all of that. Because if you're coming from a more grungy, stoner, uh, but even shoegaze, rock approach, uh, that's going to have a lot of influence on how you then approach things in modular as well. So how do you then see that influencing your modular music as well? How, any Anything that you would like to point out? I would say the only kind of, 
I take the harmonic content ideas and just try to put them into a modular perspective, I would say. Mm-hmm. I mean, because some, some of the stuff I do on the modular, um, I still write down like I would write out a song. Um, you know, if I would sit down with a guitar or something, I mean, I still kind of do that um, just to figure out uh, harmony mm-hmm. and then just kind of figure out how I'm going to take that and, you know, what voices in the modular are going to do what each string on the guitar did type of thing, if that makes sense. No, no um, absolutely. Where you, where so, you actually say, well, uh, a guitar is essentially, well, g- given a regular guitar, it's going to be si- six voices uh, tops. And yeah. how, will then, how will those then, well, translate into... Yeah, and it doesn't always, into, you yeah. know, fully translate, but it's like the rough idea, you know. Because mm-hmm. um, I really don't have that many voices, but... <clears throat> But I, I like to use a lot of um, harmonic oscillators that sync up to the main oscillator because that's a real, for me, that's a way to really ex- expand your voicing, you know, it's sound palette or make it sound much bigger with just doing minimal amount of work. Because mm-hmm. um, that, whole, that yeah. harmonic oscillator is always going to be synced up to your main oscillator. So it's, yeah. you know, if you got the your harmonic relationship set the way you want, you don't have to worry about it. You know, oh, you you know, it's just it's nice. No, but well, absolutely, no, no one worries now. Absolutely, but you li- you listen to Cluster back then, uh, mm-hmm. but then still, I'm assuming going from 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 tape machines from uh, from radios into Eurorack. There's a there's quite a big well time frame in the meantime, right? <laughs> Yeah, there was like, I would say, I mean, because that was still a good, I mean, modular was still a good 10 years out for me at that point. But there was, um, around that same time, there was a, a, a nice store here called Nova Music, which I still think they might do stuff online, but they used to have a storefront. And um, yeah, I don't know if you ever heard of the Wired system from Grant Richter. It's a blue... Uh, modular system. It's, it's, it's not 3U, it's its own thing. Um, I forget about the companion channel, but Grant Richter <laughs> is from here. Um, I'm, kind of, I'm pulling it up on my phone. Um, yeah, no so worries. he's a designer from here. And this place, Nova Music, had this thing set up as like a, um, you know, just a demonstration. So I went there and played on this thing, and I was like, I really need to get into modular or whatever this world is oh um, and then you've got wired as in w-i-a-r-d oh geez, yes. yeah yeah and that's of course so guy, everything that um make noise but also what's yes. the other company called well um mm. what's his name you just had him on uh the guy from erica since they did like a, a, re, a reproduction yeah. of the woggle bug but it wasn't licensed so i think they had to rename it um, whereas the make noise is a licensed thing from Grant himself. Yeah. Like Grant signed off on it. Um, but yeah, so this guy lives around here. He's an interesting fellow. Um, but so I, he, that is the first modular system that I played on was the wired system. And I was about an hour late to work that day. Um, (laughs) In which I worked around the corner. I got off the bus. I'm like, I got a little time to kill. I'm going to go to the music store. And then I just got, I totally get lost in it. Um, and that's when I kind of started finding about the dope first stuff. Because that's mm-hmm. when they, they, all that was coming up. It's just, but at the time, I'm like, that. the money was just a little, the price difference was a little too much for me. Yeah. Oh, um, the other so, name I was thinking about is Maleko, of course. Okay. They 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 they, would... they do a lot of the wired things as well. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay. Well, at um, least I think well, they we... actually. I'm not. Of course, I, I'm not quite sure what kind of uh, agreements they've got in place, but okay. The um, the modules do. At least some of the older ones, they did Damn. mention wired. Right. Okay. So... Yeah, the picture that just. Uh or I don't know if I'm pronouncing their name right, they're in the companion channel. That That's kind of what I played on. Awesome, um, yeah. It was really nice. But so that was kind of like my intro to it. I felt like 
I don't know. It felt like you were, you know, it made you feel like a little kid again, where it was all about just, <laughs> you know, like kind of make believe, you know, and you're just kind of playing and you're just making shit up as you go along. Um, so once I had the opportunity to get into modular, um, cause I broke my hand essentially and I couldn't play piano. I couldn't play guitar. I was getting antsy. Oh, wow. Um, because you just from not playing anything, and then I had a little extra money at the time. I'm like, well, you know, and just previous, I saw my friend um, play a performance with the modular here in Milwaukee, and then I'm like, all right, now may, it might be the time to get into it. So he kind of <laughs> helped out and was like, yes, get into it. And it, that's where it all just fell. Um, mm-hmm. Were those felt, things related that, 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 that you broke your hand and you had a bit more money to spend or? Well, my dad just happened, I mean, he passed. So I basically had money yeah. from like his, you know, just money. And I just needed something to kind of mm-hmm. um, connect with again. Um, Cause I had been yeah. out of music for a little bit. I mean, there was some kind of personal stuff that was happening at that time. And yeah, there was a little darkness and, um, I would say that getting the modular really helped coming out of that darkness immensely. Just to have that creative outlet, you might say. Yeah. And that that particular creative outlet too. I don't think getting just, you know, had I not broken my hand and just still been able to play guitar or, you Mm -hmm. know, you know, whatever I felt like I probably would still do it the same thing or, um, I don't know. It's just, but, Mm -hmm. I, I would there yeah there was a lot of depression and just it was it was not a good time and like that was kind of like the shining beacon of that time and it's just it kind of helped me kind of get out of it so I kind of look at it as a very like kind of a cathartic release meditation type thing sometimes with it mm-hmm. um I, I mean I think I kind of gotten past using it like that where I'm kind of composing on it at this point but definitely at first it was just it was almost like primal scream therapy but routed through a modular <laughs> for me <laughs> and well and, and that's something very relatable uh for me personally but also from uh some of the other people i've had on this show as well where they uh were absolutely on top of well confirming well modular itself is cathartic it is mm-hmm. it is therapeutic and I'm personally just thinking what's the difference between working on the modular system as opposed to, well, as in your case, just uh, doing something on piano or just, uh, well, strumming away on your uh, on your guitar. What do you feel uh, is the main difference there? You know, I, that is kind of hard to, because I've asked that question to myself before. I'm like, what is the difference? You know, and like, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's just my personality. It's like I get fixated on whatever's mm-hmm. interesting to me at that point. Because I remember feeling this way before with the guitar when I get some new effects or like, you know, but I feel like I was doing that for so long that I just, I really needed a shift to something else. And maybe in another 20 years, I might feel that way about the modular. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it, it's it that it's that's kind of hard to describe because it's such a fine line of because it literally is just a, a utility utility just like an instrument like the guitar or the keyboard so mm-hmm. it's, i just think it's whatever it's there's something that i'm focused on with it and it's just kind of pushing that a little ahead of all the other instruments you know i mean i don't even have calluses on my fingers anymore from playing guitar <laughs> i don't really play that much you know it's kind of that kind of sucks. <laughs> but don't don't you have the calluses from just putting in, well, patch cables then? Because I I actually had that feeling, especially when I got started. Like I, I'm I'm trying to get calluses just from 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 doing that. But, <laughs> gotcha. But the, that might be just my my girly fingers uh, doing that, <laughs> of course. But yeah, no worries. But then once you got past that point when modular became more than just patching therapy mm-hmm. however you want to call it how did that then transform into the the creativeness and the artistry that you're uh, that you're working on right now 
I mean, well, I felt like, I mean, you know, the first two years or three years was all experimentation. And, uh, you know, the more I kind of like honed down techniques with it and, mm -hmm. you know, because I would write down all kind of, you know, all the patches I would do. And then I would start going through. I'm like, oh, I kind of like the way this one sounded. And, you know, maybe I would mix it with this other patch. So I started developing certain systems with it. And um, I think that's where I was like, okay, I guess that's where it just kind of came from as, as opposed to like, now it's not experimentation. Now it's time to do something with all that experimentation. Yeah. Um, and then I, there's, once I got a few of the SQ1s, I just got real anal about doing harmonic stuff. And because before, you know, I, I really wouldn't tune stuff. I would just, you know, patch and, but then I got real anal about it. Everything had to be in tune mm -hmm. and, and um you know so i think that's where that that's where it all started um but that's and, where it all shifted that way and by sq1 you meant you meant the, the cork like the little yeah the sq1 okay, yeah. cork uh, so i got sequencer. four of those oh, yeah, wow, sequencer. yeah so um because sometimes i'll start a patch and i'm like i'm gonna just be loose today you know and I'm, i won't try to tune it and I won't even worry about it where the tempo was, but at some point mm -hmm. that creeps in. I'm like, all right, I got to tune in. I got to get, because all my tempo, all the delays is always tempo sync. So at some point it always will get a little tighter and then I'll start thinking about recording it. But that is still your go-to sequencer for, for anything where you might have um, all four of them running in tandem or. Yeah. Um, for the most part, I mean, let's see, I'm looking at my system right now. That is the main one I have. I did have, which my favorite sequencer, um, I would say, uh, well, one of them is the Bin Dubba from Nonlinear Circuits. Mm -hmm. His stuff is fun in such a wacky and an unpredictable way. Um, I really enjoyed having that when I use it as a demo when I uh, used to do videos for Modular Attic. Um, mm -hmm. And then my friend Logan from Logan Electronics, yeah, he has this prototype that I'm still trying to get him to get out. I'm begging him to just put it out. <laughs> um, but I used to we used to be roommates, and so he had it just. Oh no, around. you don't say! Wow. Yeah, because um, I used to live it. I mean, I went moved back and forth to new orleans and at one point when i moved back up here i just needed a place and he's like well just you know so we became roommates which was a lot of fun in its own right um because it was just like you know synthesizers all the time there's surge everywhere it was just crazy <laughs> um but anyway he had this you know this crazy module that was just a prototype and that that's my favorite sequencer ever um and then I forget what's the one that's really kind of cool. I, I, I'm, I got a chance to really mess with it at uh, Nobcon. Uh, I think it's the Vector Sequencer, no. which I don't have. I can't remember if that's the name of it. Um, I'm looking it up right now. This one was pretty cool. This one made me realize it was time to get a really good Yeah, the 512, the 512 one. Uh, Vector Eurex Sequencer Silver. Vector, yeah. I found guy, it here that... on 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 signal sound, so I'm not quite even sure if Kyle is on the call, but he'll probably appreciate that me uh, yeah. <laughs> for me calling out signal sounds. But yeah, wow, um, that's a cool sequence, and the, the the guy that makes it, he's a cool guy, Jim. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that one that's probably next on my list for sequencers. And which one were you uh, mentioning for nonlinear circuits? The oh, uh, the bin double. It's such a wacky, just crazy. The Let me bin get that double. Quick. Let, let's see yeah. if I can find it. <laughs> I mean, I would highly recommend any of yeah, this stuff. Got it? Yeah. You got it? Yeah, I got it here on on just on 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 his website. So uh, the bin double sequencer. I've never even looked into that. And, I, <laughs> and I'm still, well, sequences are still one of the things that I'm, I'm working on. So I've got I mean, the, um, I've got the, uh, what's it called? Uh, 
I'm mainly using the Hermits right now. I've got the Nerd Sec, uh, which um, which is just intimidating for me, to be quite honest. Yeah, it's deep looking. Oh, jeez. Oh, absolutely. And uh, don't get me wrong, <sighs> Thomas is great, and but it's it's so intimidating for me not being classically trained, right? And yeah. It is. It is what it is. And then the other one you just mentioned was from uh, the guy you were in college with, roommates. Um, roommate. Well, not in college, but yeah, roommates with. But he, it's not out. It's just. It's his own little. There's only one of it in existence. So. Oh no. But that's that's why I'm like, please just put it out. <laughs> He's kind of getting out of your rack. He's going into for you and stuff. So I don't know if he'll ever see the light of day. But oh. I mean, it was. It was my it was my favorite one to use, and it and it popped out if I remember right. I think it popped out gates for mm-hmm. each one of the steps. Like it was just a really cool, really fun thing. Um, I'm sure I have. I mean, I had, I could go through my Instagram. I'm sure there's video of it somewhere. That's that got to be, be awesome. it from a year or two ago. That would be awesome because that's so. of course what I what I pr- personally I I'm still on this quest to find the right sequencer for me. Uh. I mean, it's not, I mean, these, like the Bin Dubba and his, or it's because the way they do, dude, it's not like you're going to say, I'm going to make this specific sequence. You know, if I need mm-hmm. a specific sequence, that's what I use the uh, SQ1s for. You know, if I want to, yeah. you know, like those, the other ones, like the Bin Dubba and my friend, like Logan's, it's, those were my riffing sequencers, if that makes sense, where those just would riff. Yeah would be the doing the lead lines or the riff stuff over the more consistent stuff coming from the SQ1. Where you actually want to improvise and like mm-hmm. a guitarist actually want to improvise and just solo yeah. one. Yeah. No, but that, that kind that, of yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, why I yeah, like those because they were just you could you know, just by a flip of a switch you could just, you know, make it jump around and like get all really crazy. And then, you know, you pull some of that back and all of a sudden you have it more restrained. You know, I, I kind of had a system with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I would, I don't know if you ever heard of uh, Morph Acoustic. Um, I use his stuff a lot as well for uh, making the sequence to sound more, um, I guess, complicated than what they are just from the inherent nature of his like uh, modules because the way they can transpose incoming CV. Um, well, I found his. Um, I found his website, uh, Morph Acoustic. Uh, yeah. Which if module you, did you mean? The, put um, up in the companion channel. That I I use the tran added a transposer a lot. That thing's dope as shit. Like I could, that was one. Um, I would say like after even the first night of using it, thinking like I need two of these. Um. So he, he's got two modules up there, the intervallic and the random subdividers. I'm assuming you're, mm-hmm. you're talking about the intervallic then. No, I'm talking about the... Wait, the additive transposer's not on his website? Well, huh. No, I might be. It should be. It better be. Because um, last <laughs> time, I'm like... Because... <laughs> uh, Dude, that means he hasn't updated his website in a while because I thought I had to tell him, like, you got to put that up there because it's only got the intervallic and the random subdivider. Yeah. Um, the intervallic's cool, too. That's another – it's a nice little – I use that for riffing uh, sequences, too. Um, and it's kind of compact, so I like using that uh, as well. I just haven't used it in a while. But I'm always – the additive transposer is pretty much, I would say, in about 75% of my patches. Um, nice. It's just nice because the way he has it laid out where it's like you have this incoming CV and you can jump the CV up by a minor third or drop it by a minor third, perfect fifths, you know. Mm-hmm. And then you start getting combinations of those and you can pretty much jump around a whole scale, you know. It's – you know, and you, so you're basically just setting the same CV in it, mm-hmm. but using that to make it sound like it's jumping around. It's, that's well, what I on like. On the one hand, it. just jumping around, but you can also compress it into, I just want to, you to stay into this one single octave, right? And Yeah, you can do yeah. that, yeah. And, that and you know, those switches also have CV, so you can, exactly. So I'll use, 
you know, one of the SQ ones just to control those intervallic jumps, you know. Yeah. Um, so that that SQ one usually will, will run like at a much slower clock than the other ones because I just you know don't want it to jump around too much. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I do my harmonic stuff with that one. Yeah, but it also reminds me a bit of what I'm using the the Fraser for uh, uh, the Fraser from uh, Super Synthesis. I'm not sure if you've seen not that. heard of that. Uh, super synth. Oh. It's one of Fraser. my. Yeah, let me just see if I can find it. Mm. Super synthesis. Um, so I've got the super synthesis Fraser and the two or PFM, and especially the Fraser is like one of the most fun things I've ever worked with. And if you then compare it to the two or PFM, so I've got two phrases, one, uh, one two or PFM, and it's mm. just fun, and it just, it, it really tell, it, it just looks at you and screams, play with me, make sure that we can work together, huh. and I think that that's from a from a riffing perspective, that is really hands on, which is a lot mm. less well constrained from what I can see just now from things like the the Bindaba or maybe even the uh what's the other one you mentioned? The one from uh from Morph Acoustic. Oh the yeah the intervallic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the wait, or the added transposer. I'm sorry. I can't remember which one we're talking about. I'm looking nah, at no worries, I'm no worries. looking at these things you threw up. That's kinda cool. I haven't heard of this. Is this a newer company then? Um, Jeez, been they've the been around so I did my first show with Super with, oh, okay. Synthesis um, uh, geez now I need to look it up I think it's yeah, I more, more than a year they, they, they've, oh, they've been great um, let's see huh I've just got a new keyboard, so I still need to learn that as well. I might have to check this one out. No, oh, this is absolutely and the guy doing the, the guy doing that is absolutely fantastic, and he's got a great approach to to modular design and just the things that he shared with us when we were talking to them. Um, so uh, his name is uh, Chris McDowell. He's absolutely fantastic. And the two, uh, I've got a video on my channel going into the Fraser and the Tool PFM. And I think that those modules were the ones that really opened my eyes into modular and saying, well, okay, well, Hey, this is how you do hands-on modular, specifically yeah. regarding the Fraser, and I loved it, and that really, well, it blew me away. Yeah, there's definitely seems to be a lot of different <clears throat> modes of thinking as far as like have those autopilot patches or ones yeah. that you kind of don't want to patch too much CV in because you want to get your hands in there, you know? And, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, you just want to make sure, okay, well, this is what you want to do. This is the sound you want. And yeah. I'm just expecting a very specific either MIDI signal or uh, I want to have a, uh, a CV value exactly between X and X plus Y uh, something. And that, that then just works. But these kind of modules really will invite you to experiment and that's what i really loved absolutely yeah i feel like that's a big uh you know a big aspect to it where like if it, it feels inviting or the, the playability of the instrument um in you know i feel like certain modules that i've seen sometimes i like if i can't fully understand what I, especially when i first started um like if i couldn't understand what it was right off the gate i was like i wasn't feeling it at first um mm-hmm to me, that's why I feel like the all the mutable instrument stuff, the the simplicity of the layout. I mean, I was just 
I was, it was all that stuff is really easy to understand. So that's kind of why I gravitated to some of the, those things at first. Um, yeah. And then, um, cause when like, especially the first panel of the make noise mass, it's like, now I, now I understand it. But when I first looked at it, I'm like, the hell is this? It's like, it's just thunderbolts. <clears throat> What's happening here? <laughs> you know, <laughs> which I love maths. I mean, I, it's, but I just, you know, but then I looked at clouds and I'm like, oh, I can, I understand at least what this is trying to tell me, uh, type of thing. So, but yeah. it's all a learning curve, and it's like, are you willing to? It's all about if you're willing to go with it, or just, you know, or just sell it and buy something new, or you know, just keep going in that um, vicious circle. So, well, and as you said, it is about that investment and that dedication to learning. And mm -hmm. a lot of the people that I've talked to that got into modular during the last couple of years, uh, whether that was, okay, well, I'm, I'm locked down due to COVID or I'm at a, let's say, creative rod uh, where I'm looking for something else. It's about that challenge. It's about the, let's say... Um, unrelenting almost even un discernible approach for modular where where you need to do it right or don't do it at all uh, where people are challenging themselves and I think that that is something um, where you do see a lot of people diving into it over the course of the last two maybe even three years now um, mm-hmm yeah and that is of course well for me as as, as a total newbie I've, I've started the whole thing just over a year ago so absolutely you know I, I i wholeheartedly agree with this yeah i've definitely seen a bunch of like i i i, I mean i feel like i haven't been into it that long mm -hmm. and i'm already feeling like i'm been seeing kind of like the third or fourth swell with it you know it's kind of <laughs> <you know? laughs> um so I mean, I kind of always, I mean, I always kind of knew it existed. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever heard of a movie called Phantom of the Paradise. Um, heard about it, but haven't had so, the time to do that. As a kid, I mean, I remember seeing this movie and they use, they, they use the synthesizer, the Tonto synthesizer um, mm -hmm. as like the backdrop in it. So, of course, I just thought it was a prop, you know. Yeah. And then once I realized um, that thing was an actual freaking instrument, I was like, wow, I, you know, so that I always, uh, there was always something attainable. It's like, that's where I want to get to. Uh, so it just took a little longer than I thought it would take to get there. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. because man, the, the, the Tonto instrument is really, that's, that's just a really crazy synthesizer. Um, it's, let me pull it up. Well, uh, we already have um, Z Forge uh, share the Tonto one okay. in the companion channel. Absolutely. Yeah, it was. Uh, what's his name? I'm, his name is eluding me all of a sudden. Um, Stevie Wonder used it on a few of his early records. Awesome. Uh, which is why I think after, because after like there was like two or three records from him that sounded really good, and then especially once he got to the eighties, it was just really bad preset synth stuff and I feel like well he stopped using the Tonto so maybe he should have never stopped using that because I feel like his music kind of changed after that <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's like some cool footage of like the creators the guys that put Tonto together and Stevie Wonder he's just sitting there playing and these two dudes are just patching so he's probably <laughs> sitting there playing and listening like yeah that sounds good okay no stop playing you know don't change it Okay, you know, so I'm like, that's a really cool, like, collaborative thing happening. Well, there, and you know. then, then he becomes not just a conductor for the, for the arrangement, but he becomes the conductor for the, for the modular synth, uh, you yeah, would say, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, that's pretty cool, because I never really thought about 
too much about Stevie Wonder growing up, but then I saw that. I'm like, wow, I need to oh, yeah. kind of give him some a little bit of respect. But I'm like, yeah, but his 80s stuff still kind of blue turds. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I... <laughs> so, I can't, you know... There's this song, I'll just say this. There's this song called Part-Time Lover from him. And I worked at this grocery store before the job I have now. And grocery stores just have shitty speakers it's all about mid-range in the speakers and it just accentuated the snare it was like a midi snare in the song and it just accentuated the snare so like yeah i it would just enrage me when that song would come on because all i would hear the whole time is just that snare and it's like just beating and i'm like this is a drum sheet like oh it's just it was so <laughs> i'm like i can't listen to him anymore <laughs> well um, my generation had that where when Metallica released um, what was the album called again? Saint Anger. When you had that really Tommy sounding um, uh, snare, mm -hmm. that was uh, I think that that would relate to the same thing where you said, <laughs> okay, well this is this is just a drum sound we can't work with. Uh, you just yeah. lost the the trust of this whole generation. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. No worries, no worries. Um, <laughs> okay, so now we we do have some feedback from the channel. Um, I'm not gonna uh, read out all of the things. Uh, so apparently, Dist uh, liked that album. I'm not quite sure if he's talking about the Stevie Wonder or Saint Anger. Uh, thing one biscuit tin metal was born um that was always a let's say a well biscuit tin metal yeah no um i've I, 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 I always um i've always been into the metal scene and i'm st i still am and saint anger with the almost bouncy snare drum that was a abomination <laughs> and I'll, I'll let anyone fight me over that no don't you worry uh, <laughs> uh, but that being said uh, one of the other things I, I did want to talk about uh, John and, and we've had a great chat already and as always I'm always aiming to do an interview of 30 minutes but we're already almost at the top of the hour again. Uh, but one of the things we also want to talk about is how you've been helping uh, Starling. Uh, yeah. Starling. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> it almost sounds like I'm saying Starling, but it's Starling. <laughs> it's probably like, well, as I said, I've been working for the UK and Ireland for way too long where I'm just going to, swallow all of the r's and g's but yeah g's no we're talking about starling um, starling yeah <laughs> <laughs> so have you been helping those uh those guys as well um, so um how, how's that how, how, how that came to be uh basically um uh, i just i met will through uh probably logan and now through the synth uh community here at synth meetups um and they were just designing something. Um, I'm trying to remember how like the Epidus came from. I, I think they were trying to like create something that would crossfade two signals, but at an audio rate. Because mm -hmm. um, sometimes, I mean, that's how this like they'll just sit around this. It's basically like this crazy laboratory with all this test gear and just insane. It's a very surreal space, and they'll just sit around and like just dream up shit like hey let's you know what if we made something like this and then they'll just make it and they realized it sounded like a kind of a cool oscillator and that's how the meta came to be so they started fine tuning it to where it could be pitchable and stuff um but they were just building this thing and then i kind of got in on it they asked you know if i wanted to try it and um i just kind of became like this beta tester for them and uh proponent for whatever they do i mean I mean, I I love all the stuff they make, so yeah, it just kind of came. It kind of became this symbiotic relationship. Um, 
and the other guy Jason Nana that's involved he's kind of he, uh, it's it's his space basically but he was you know they're both kind of like local musicians but um, so I kind of knew him you know from years ago and then just I hadn't seen him for a while and then we kind of reconnected over this whole Starling thing um, so you know I helped him out with that I was helping him out with like when I was gone to Navcon. Mm -hmm. I basically help work out the table. Um, basically, you just post whatever I do uh, with their stuff. Um, yeah, I don't think my, you know, because I don't my sound would not be my sound without their stuff. I mean, awesome. If I, you know, it'd be completely different have if I didn't have their stuff in my system. And are you specifically talking about the um, the VR platform or more about yeah. the the um, what's the other parts to talk about the, the more trs approach the t they i don't have any of the trs stuff here uh that's still kind of i would say uh in development right now mm -hmm. um <clears throat> but it's that's going to be really interesting um just the even like because we were listening to one of like the the sinks the other day where it was like had these two oscillators and instead of like the oscillator like crossfading like panning between two speakers you know you had each oscillator in mm -hmm. each speaker so that absence of that sound the way it like you know it felt on your ears it just felt it was really cool because you can get these really cool pleasant you know pannings but that's or yeah. just just real like disorienting where it, like you almost can't stand straight you know <laughs> um because that's, I mean, we just get stupid. Like I was saying in the studio, we get, you know. But, yeah, the TRS stuff's going to be really neat. Um, so they're, and they're also working on some other stuff that I really haven't asked them about what I could talk about with them. <laughs> or not with them, but like out in public. So Yeah. No, that makes sense. Just, Absolutely. No worries. It's just, they're, it, yeah, they're, they're always working on something. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fun going over there and um, messing around with it. So, Well, and especially just the breadth of, um, well, just to focus on the VR uh, platform, it mm. is broader than the platform that, for instance, uh, Noise Engineering has currently, uh, where it's they, simply... Yeah. Yeah, but on the other hand, it's quite comparable to that, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I think they have the same faceplate, and you can like put the same firmware on it, where like the Via stuff has different faceplates yeah. for each firmware. So there's a yeah, uh, there's a little difference. I mean, because at one point it was all going to be the same module, and like, like that's the whole thing. It, it started out as one thing, and then I I go over there one night and like, hey, we came up with this firmware and this firmware, and and then this firm. I'm like, holy fuck, like. It just yeah, expanded geez, yeah. like at a really rapid pace, you know. Um, and then there's firmwares that they have that it just never went anywhere. And so I'm like, that's you know, it's they have a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. It, so, do, do you know if it's based about the uh, on the uh, Daisy platform or what kind of platform is it based on? Uh, Daisy, uh, like a the uh, the VR platform. You, uh, yeah, uh, I. I don't remember offhand. Um, I'd have to look that part up. I can't remember. Yeah, I'm try um, trying to find it on the website, but I don't I'm sure think it, it is. was. I, uh, it, I don't think it was Daisy, if I'm remember. Correctly. It's not Daisy, um, but I just can't remember what it is, and it's. I'm I'm a little rusty with like the shop talk about the those in particular, because <laughs> um, that's what like those guys do. Like when we, you know, when we go to like Nobcon, I went with Will. You know, like it's a good like uh, I would say it's a good duo because I'm you know I, we both perform with them but I'm good at talking you know like I talk about yeah. the performance stuff and he's the technical guy you know um, plus yeah. our our patching that's a, that's another thing that's why we like working together kind of because I've patched stuff that I think would be such a you know like I this is the only way I could, would patch with these and they're like wow I never thought of you know patching that way with it you know and then they'll patch something i'm like wow that's fucking deep like i never mm -hmm, would have thought mm -hmm. about patching that way but i'm like mine seems sort of rudimentary <laughs> like you know yeah um but that's what's nice about going over there and just you know we'll just kick it and just start 
patch and stuff and that you know kind of like we were talking about before which is like this playland and you just see what happens so yeah i know but that's absolutely one of the things where it's all about you might say how it then translates into the actual artist that's using it right as opposed to uh, focusing on the underlying technology that's being used yeah and um we did get one comment from um from z4 uh, saying well uh, noise engineering and qubit tend to use uh, the daisy tsp uh dsp platform um i've been recording the video on the qubit surface and that was indeed based on I'm assuming it was Daisy, but I'm not quite sure if it was, but I'll look into that. But then again, these are all these really reusable platforms that you might want to, uh, yeah, that you want, might want to reuse. And I think that on the one hand, you've seen a lot of these more digitally focused, well, uh, modular designers, like on the one hand, uh, organizations like Rebel Technology, uh, Bafaco, Noise Engineering, um, Qubit as well, uh, that tend to gravitate towards a more reusable platform that they can then use to do any sort of thing that they can that they they want. Uh, maybe then even the Bafaco Lich or the uh, Rebel Technology Owl platform being the well, the really ultimate examples of those, where you yeah, might that's actually like... yeah, that that that's absolutely phenomenal. And then we've had uh, Manu from Bafaco on last week, and I've done a couple of videos on the Witch and the Lich. And where do you see well modular going towards? Where it's going to be more analog more fit for purpose modules or do you see things gravitate into more towards these well we, we've got very generalistic modules that you can then program to fit your need i almost feel like because it feels like it, it might be going that route because i mean just because of the programmability of those things um mm -hmm. so I don't know. I feel like it might always be kind of a middle ground where because you might always have that niche thing. You know, I, at least I hope there will always be the niche for the analog. I mean, because um, you kind of always kind of need a balance. I mean, what would happen if that was just completely gone? But um, it just seems like, a, it, you know, you like you're saying, like the accessibility to those uh, programming uh, platforms, I feel like that just might take off. I mean, um, because you said that who's the one that does the Daisy patch? Isn't that that's the module? The, the, it's a gray module, right? Um, yeah, no, I forgot forgot the name to be honest, but because you know. they even make a guitar pedal like that, which I didn't know they made a guitar pedal like that, um, where you could just program it and do whatever the fuck you you know have a, a guitar pedal do whatever you want. Um, Electro. So smooth. that's just, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. I mean th that is kind of nice. Um, absolutely and then yeah. what happens when like even that programming language becomes almost like a GUI where you don't have to learn a language um mm -hmm. where you you know like i used to make vsts with a uh a program called synth edit and it's like i didn't i never learned any coding it's just it was all a GUI. it's like it had all like the utilities but as modules so you just yeah. basically you connected like i needed a vca uh, this and that uh, and then it would compile that into a usable VST that you could bring, then bring into your DAW and then use it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, if once that starts happening, then if, if that starts happening with some kind of GUI where you can create certain things in a more visual, visual aspect, as opposed to a coding aspect, you would definitely have more people getting into it. Yeah. So. And that is something that you do see with uh, modules like the um, 
the Euro Bureau from um, what's it called again? From 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 Empress, uh, where you do see a more uh, declarative approach to modular design. Uh, but then the question becomes is when you start using more of these digital modules doesn't that then defeat the purpose of using modular um, whereas i'm not necessarily defining modular as necessarily being analog but having a single uh, single function modules as well where you might want to say well how pure or how purist or how puritanical do you want to be when it comes to modular yeah um <laughs> i don't know how to yeah i guess <clears throat> i guess that's what i was getting at before I'm like you, there might always be a balance for everything mm -hmm. um um yeah i don't know how to expand on that yeah, no worries, no worries. I'm I'm no, no, I'm I'm not asking about the uh the forty two answer on all of that, but I'm 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 more interested to hear what your um your take you know, on that is. You were like yeah. saying if you're going all that digital rod, just why are you using the macho in the first place as opposed to like a computer or something or uh... Well, even even if you are using things like a Euro Bureau or all of these teensy and um, uh, daisy base modules. Mm -hmm. The one thing they still offer is that hands-on control. And yeah. the question then becomes is, is that enough for people oh. to, to say, well, that's why I'm going to invest into modular or into your rack. Or will that just become a a well uh, a sink for people where they say, okay, I'm just going to buy the noise engineering uh, BIA plugin, and I'm just going to use a MIDI interface to do that hands-on control. So uh -oh. where uh -oh. where are we from uh -oh. a from a modular perspective? How are we going to ensure that we differentiate ourselves? And if the answer is, well, there is no differentiation, that's a fair answer as well. But uh, it, yeah, I, do, yeah. I, I don't really see that. I mean, I mean, people are already kind of incorporating, like, I think you can use VCV rack as plugins and yeah. vice versa. But I mean, on the whole, especially when you see more, like, you know, your outdoor module on the spot performances and stuff, those are always going to be. Um, I would say, for the most part, it seems like it's mo mostly just modular stuff. So, yeah, um, I never really see it going full, you know, any kind of like um, current going full tilt that way, or you know. So, I don't, you know, I can't really. Mm -hmm. No, but this is but it would... probably like the toughest question there is in, in modular. <laughs> and... Yeah, it's kind of a subjective one. Yeah, because well. The thing it actually asks is, is analog in that way different from digital? And I think that that touches upon the actual core beliefs within people who are uh, operating within the modular realm, you might even say. So, and that is probably like the one question you shouldn't ask. <laughs> 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 no but great no, no, no and don't you worry john i i truly appreciate your 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 honesty and your um your view on these things and um even though we are way over time um before we want to open it up for uh for q a i always have two questions and you probably already know exactly what those questions are going to be but my first question of that well series of two is if you were to go back to that point in time when john was still working on his guitar 
and that finally hurt or was intrigued by synthesizers exactly at that point in time what would be your number one piece of advice for for john at that time at that time oh i guess just as, i guess the same to just keep going down the path you're on because i mean that's what ultimately led me to it um i wouldn't want to try to deviate from it mm -hmm. um so i mean that kind of brings in a whole time loop thing like <laughs> Like yeah, you, like you you say anything and then like you might just change the whole. Uh, yeah, but just it, overall, I would just say don't change it. Just just stay on the path you're on, because it's gonna get you to where you need to be, or where you where you are now, or where I'm now. So more in lines of keep on the, the road that you're on. Um, yeah. Even though you might not see any light at the end of the tunnel, but just keep <laughs> on grinding. You might even say because yeah. Well, I think I think we all understand how it might be when you're young and you've got this Grant's idea of hey, I want to be a a musician. I want to be a rock star. I want to be a an EDM star. Those kind of things. And we had um, Clemens on the show last week who talked a bit about the, well, the sacrifices he's had to, he had to make to, to actually live that life. And yeah, for sure. There is some there. Yeah. But how was that? Yeah. Uh, how does that translate into your life? Is there something that you've been? I'm kind of a private yeah. person, so. Yeah, no, no worries. I kind of like being on my own. Um, then because mm -hmm. I, I don't worry about scheduling and <laughs> and stuff. And I mean, I just I'm I'm kind of just on this I this path of trying to get all this music done. So I really don't have time for um, extraneous stuff a lot of the times. Um, so I hang out with the people I need to hang out with when I want to hang out with them. And yeah. um. That's pretty much it. I mean, yeah, like, you know, I'm going to go hang out with my daughter after this and, awesome. and then come home and just do some music, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's an absolute great uh, outlook uh, for for today, of course. And then, yeah. yeah, just one final question for me. And again, John, thank you so much for allowing me to really dive into your psyche and how you approach things being a musician an artist uh, a consultant and all of the other things that you do i truly appreciate that and i again want to thank you for your time here um but i do want to return the favor as well so i'm not quite sure if you've got any questions for me that you want to uh, ask in um I forgot about that part. Um, yeah, no worries, no worries. <laughs> yeah. I always hope people forget about that. Yeah. Um, all right. So, what made you want to get into this? Then that I don't know if I've heard people ask you that. No, but it's 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 an um. The nice thing about that is is that the answer to that is ever evolving. Because um. If you asked me this question, let's say uh, six months ago, I would I would have just said, "Well, I wanted to have something that that gave me some sort of purpose during COVID." Uh, but if I were to answer it right now, it's all about well, I've finally come into a point in my life, or maybe even into my psyche, or into what, what drives me as a human being, however you want to call it, um, where I'm like, okay, well, music is always going to be an integral part of um, the way I enjoy life. And I've never been trained classically. I've never, I've never learned how to play a musical instrument. And even though that was the case i've always been very active in the music industry 
I've always been working with bands. I've always been there on the sidelines. Um, I've been a a vocalist, and I use that term very speci- uh, very well, very cognizant because I would never call myself a singer um, within metal. But still, I always want to have a role to play within that musical industry you might say and i feel that i finally found a way to do that without just going overboard and that is then well modular synthesizers because i'm liking the things that i'm doing i am finally able to well deliver on my creative promises uh, without well having to well <laughs> go back into I'm just going to abuse my voice for that <laughs> right on okay. a lo- long answer but yeah, absolutely uh, great question and I love that you asked that question because it, it is an ever evolving answer for me um, that being said um Let's open it up for people in the audience. I already see that uh, Slaw, Slaw's Law and Dist have raised their uh, their their hands to uh, to ask some questions. Uh, they've been for quite some time, so well, let's make sure that we. Uh, yeah, you did. So, uh, oh, you, you just lowered your hand. This so no <laughs> maybe you realize he didn't have it up. Yeah, no, no, no worries. But if you've got a question, um, feel free to want to ask that in the companion channel. Um, if you do want to, well, get on the stage, make sure you do so. Uh, otherwise, I'm just gonna have a quick look in the companion channel if we have any. Do you have a modular grid? That's a great question from Z4. Um, do I? Um, I'm assuming I have an account. Um, I'm sure I haven't updated it in a while. I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, hottest take on your Rack 20. Ooh. Jeez. I don't know. I kind of like it. There was a, what was it? The new thing from AI synthesis. Um, Mm -hmm. Look pretty cool. It's a a harmonic mixer. Um, Podular Modcast, he just posted it, but it basically will add waveforms to your like incoming signal. And uh, let's see. I'm pretty sure it will, like if you prank it, it's going to add some distortion. So it goes from like, uh, probably some kind of you know subtle saturation to distortion um, with that waveforms it's adding. Um, that looked kind of cool. Um, I'm trying to find and, a link to that. Do you have? Um, yeah, I'm just looking at into AI the Podular Modcast um, um, system. Well, here we go. Let's see if I can find it. There we go. Oh. And he's his stuff is, uh, it's all kits. Yeah, I mean, you can't you can buy, um, build stuff, but he has his his. If you're kind of getting into wanting to build, his mm-hmm. stuff's pretty good for that. I would say, um, trending. I think his product like that mixer is like all the way down on his website. Yeah, I don't be, know yeah. if any. I don't know if anyone posted it. Uh, let me see. Harmonic mixer. Oh yeah. Slow. Especially when I want it to be faster. <laughs> it's always the same, right? There we go. But it is part of the AI. There we go. That one. Um, that looks pretty cool. Um, 
there was some other stuff that seemed kind of interesting. I was talking to someone about now. I can't remember what it was. So, um, yeah. And other than that, I really haven't been. I've been so. I've been in post production mode a lot uh, with yeah. so much music that I kind of been out of uh, the loop as far as what else is coming out and stuff. Because, um, I mean, like I was just record. I mean, I I record nonstop pretty much, and I mean, I haven't recorded anything since I would say no- last November, like around Thanksgiving, and yeah. I've just been trying to finish albums so. Um, I kind of I do need to get my head out from that hole and see what else is happening out there with uh, modular stuff. Um, but yeah, that that one from that look that little simple thing seems kind of cool, especially if you're going to be adding it like kind of along with another voice, and it, this thing's just going to add some like you know some ear candy. That's what I'm kind of ass- assuming it's going to do is add the ear candy into my patches a little bit. Yeah, because um, that's you know harmonic distortion warmth that's all ear candy so yeah um favorite noise noise band um (laughs) (laughs) i don't really listen to just straight up noise um bands actually uh but black dice is cool um yeah um but i kind of i'll i'll do perform stuff like that sometimes Cause there is a lot of noise stuff around here in Milwaukee. Um, so it's something that I like to perform, but I don't necessarily like go listen to it. It's, it's definitely like, or go see it live. It's, it's a live <laughs> thing for me. Not, you know, I'm not going to put on Mertz bow and like, Oh, let's just blast some fucking white noise for an hour. You know, like, um, I, I'm just not going to do it, that. It, no, so. but it, that. That's typically something you have to, Yes, because it's a cathartic right? thing. It's yeah. like, yeah, you have to experience. It's like, you have to be like a, you know. I mean, I, I have misophonia, so I have a weird relationship with sound sometimes. And it's like, I hate. It's a weird way of putting it, but it's like it's almost like being assaulted, but in a good way at noise shows. <laughs> so I love but, that, but that that that's that's <laughs> like the same thing when people and. and and as I said, I come from a punk rock and metal approach where you you go to a punk rock or metal show where you say, I'm going to be, I'm going to go there to get beat up because I want yeah, to, I want to yeah. wanna go there. I want to be in the pits. I want to be there when the, when the, when the circle pit starts, I want to be there and I want to be the first guy doing, um, doing doing the first stage dive i want to be there when the when the wall of that starts and i think that that just adds to the cathartic yeah. experience of listening to live music yeah i mean there's definitely something to be said for a, like a nice live wall of sound you know so yeah absolutely um but yeah i don't necessarily listen to it too much No, nah, but still, I think that the the whole approach of having a physical response to listening to music, whether it's um, intrinsic to music itself or whether it's induced by external factors like in a metal or punk pit. Right. Oh, wait, wait, he's asking. Well, yeah. Uh, he, uh, uh, yeah. So, I do use it to process sound. I'm, uh, or it's one of the things that I need to finish releasing. Um, I have some stuff where I process my friend playing guitar, or flute, or I'll I'll send the piano through it. Um, I just don't, I just don't have any stuff out there like that yet. Um, so, but yeah, I do use it in that aspect. Awesome. A lot of things happening. It was, yeah, I was just answering that question from the companion channel. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> and this but is, yeah, I kind of want to get back into adding the piano to the, the, I feel like it's a kind of an interesting, um, I like the, the way the piano and the uh, modular sound together, especially when I'm trying to do like the strings with, uh, like rings or, 
Um, even the Via has um, like a string emulator. So that will be my like cello or, you know, violin string parts. And then I'll put the piano over it and just improv over it. Um, but that's where that whole analness about like being, you know, in key is because, you know, the, the piano is in key. So I want everything to kind of fit. So. No, but I think that that makes sense, especially if you're coming from a more classical background, then that's, of course, one of the things that you are well worried about. It might be a bit of a too strong a thing to say, but that's that's your primary response when you want to make so okay well everything needs to be in tune and once you get to a certain point you might say well okay well now it doesn't need to be so yeah where on that journey do you think that you are currently or is there something that you're pursuing as a professional artist Wait, what was the question? I'm sorry, I was reading well, that question from him. Over. Yeah, no, no worries. No, <laughs> you're getting bombarded by all by yeah. by all uh, by all vectors coming in. No, uh, when it comes to the more classical um, musical theory approaches, uh, where you might say, okay, well, I have a certain approach in mind, and especially as you said, well, I'm going to start building up. A harmony and then I'm gonna add X Y and Z on top of that um, mm -hmm. but do you see yourself being able to step away from that and experiment with other well scales or other musical harmony theories as well or do you think well for you I do I just yeah. don't that, like just most of my output has just been the more harmonic stuff um, Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I, I do, I mean, there'll be patches where I'm like, all right, this is the dissonant stuff, you yeah. know, you know, so, cause then like, cause the way I, I, my post-production, it's usually a few different takes of different patches that are going to be comped into one song, quote unquote. Yeah. So I'll record different parts and then just start piecing it together. So it's a lot, you know, and that's where like your tension and release, you know, more or less comes from, um, is from those dissonant patches being, you know, crossfaded into, oh, now everything's together. And it's like, ah, or it falling <laughs> apart, you know, or vice versa. So no, um, but then, then it becomes more of an organic approach. I'm assuming. Yeah. Where you say, mean, okay, well, this is how it evolves between... into certain things. Yeah. It's a balance between being an improv and having stuff predetermined where it's like, I actually, you know, obviously have my, uh, ornamented crime set up for a particular, you know, scale or whatever, yeah. but I'll play within that framework and I'll, you know, and then I'll change that E would keep the same patch, play within the framework and keep changing the key until I get bored. And then... <laughs> mix all those together and that's where key changes or chord changes come from in the songs it's just me you know going between the re the multi-tracks of all those different patches awesome. so it gets to be like 24 32 tracks sometimes it gets a little crazy i have to like kind of put a pin in it uh just because it gets a little logistical to kind of keep my head wrapped around it um yeah but, but if is, it, is it just it right a logistical Ableton, challenge or is it also becoming a uh um, what's that uh, well is, is is it just uh is it just the logistics rather than becoming limiting or is it also the well i hate this word but the actual musicality of it as well no it's just i get lost in like what i how much i record and all of a sudden it's like all right there's 32 tracks here yeah, you know, and, and, you know, you, and I know I'm not going to be playing all 32 tracks through the whole song, mm -hmm. you know. But just sitting there and seeing that's like it's a lot of shit. It's just <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's a lot of shit, you know. And then you yeah, have no, to, absolutely. You know, that's when I have to sit there and like organize it because if I, because there's times where I'm like I won't, I'll worry about the organizing later. Let's just get this, let's get this down and let like, record it, and then and just you know, it, two yeah. or three days later, like oh man, which one was the D minor part or you know, <laughs> it's 
So yeah. Um, but because uh, I, ha- I I mostly record onto a twenty four track Zoom recorder, so it's what so has you know three groups of eight tracks. So that was my usual thing where once I did twenty four tracks, I was done, and that was the piece. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I was going to go that t- high, sometimes it's not always twenty four tracks, uh, but yeah, I but, do have a tendency yeah. to kind of go overboard with it. No, but th- then again, just having that mental limitation um, imposed upon yourself, even even if that limitation is as broad as being twenty four, but even that yeah. is, it is going to drive inspiration, is going to drive innovation, and that is going to drive creativity as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean. A lot of people I know record straight to like an H4N and just, you know, a stereo. And I used to do that. Um, it's just once I once I went to multi-track, it was like one of those things where I was like, I just don't even, I don't want to go back. Like even when I play live shows, I bring the multi-track recorder and I just multi-track oh, yeah, the live absolutely. show. You know, it's nice. And then... Um, well, but, and I think that one of the um, the albums you shared uh, previously that I added to the companion channel. Uh, so what was it called again? Um, the jeez, oh, oh, we've we've had a well, extremely <laughs> active companion channel. So we've got the. Uh, like 1967 Oakland one, which is probably See, yeah, a great was... example of, of, of one thing that where you really went more haywire with that. Yeah, right. That that one is a that's like all right. So that's Castle Broadway. That's like the group that I yeah became involved with once I moved up here. So that but that one was a the 1967 Oakland is just one of our Sunday jams. Yeah, and that's. All those songs are in order, but I, I did all the, yeah, like I did all the found stuff and like, um, I think I had an ER one and, and a guitar. Yeah. Um, and then, so all that stuff is improv, like all that stuff's made up on the spot. Um, oh, who throw, oh, you threw in the t- the tape duet. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. But that, I, that I, I think that cool. one, once I listened to, uh, those, that's the one, three, three things. So one, um, the, uh, the Oak Creek recordings, uh, the number one, the, the seventh track, and then you've got yeah. the the, the uh, 1967 one, and the the duet. I think that that really showed a a, a tremendous um, gotcha. progression from hey, this is something that you or and by you I mean anyone listening to this. Um, could achieve as being a modular musician um yeah could 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 focus on and saying now okay, well, the other those yeah. first two those yeah. first release or all those none of those releases necessarily have modular on them um i was just like i was sending those two as like background like that's what i was like that's mm-hmm. what i started out as uh but it all like but all those things like that's when i was doing like you know, like tape machines through all the guitar oh, yeah, pedals. Absolutely, like, yeah. Yeah, all that shit. Like, yeah, the tape machine stuff, the duet thing, that was just basically me and my friend just basically having just a duet jamming. between our two tour track machines. And that thing was, that was pretty dope, man. That was a good recording. That was fun to play. No, but still, <laughs> uh, if you had access to Modular back then, you would yeah. have used it. And oh, the totally. reason is, is that the. The whole approach and at least for me being a non-specialist listening to it i would always say well this is exactly one of the things that if i were to be serious about creating modular music or adding modular sounds to a professional musician this is one of the things that it it would sound like, and that's yeah. one of the main reasons why I wanted to bring those up. Is gotcha. This is I mean, exactly I mean, what what, what, that what is we're one looking of the for. We're working yeah. on now. Um, yeah, because we still have the studio, 
And so, yeah, I, I started bringing the uh, the modular over there uh, mm-hmm. more often. And the drummer, like, I don't think we, him and I have played together yet, but he's he's put like he he's laid down drums after I played the modular. So that those two things haven't happened live per se yet. Okay. But um, well, that um, was one of my questions. So, how do you make sure that you are in sync with a with, with someone who plays physical drums uh because when from what i've learned from what i've listened to those things were spot on and i'm like okay well how would you ever get to that point if you want to play this live basically what i do when me and um josh play together it's always been the, an er1 um the core dr1 because it has a tap tempo yeah i just tap to him and then hit play and that's it <laughs> um, just to make sure and, that he he's then following you then well he he what we had a system like in 1967 where we kind of kind of the system kind of formulated um he had like i think his head he had headphones because we all played with headphones mm-hmm. he had like he could hear like i think he had a mix of me with or just the the er1 and everyone else was a little lower in the mix for him so he could really lock in to the drum machine. So that's awesome. That's all it is is me tapping the tempo. Oh, I think you're there, and like, you know, there of course there's times where it doesn't fit, and I just don't bring it back. Um, yeah. But when it fits, and he's really good at locking in on shit. Like when he hears like a beat or some hi hats about to come in, he knows something's coming. You know, so. Yeah, I mean, plus, yeah, we've all been playing together for twenty something years, you know. So, improving is easy with those guys. Awesome. Yeah. No, but that, Although, that, that, I mean, that album wasn't recorded when we were playing that long, but it was still a good one. <laughs> no, but still, from the things I've listened to and the, I'm never a great listener for hey, well, the production value of this album is phenomenal or it's, well, part of my French is shit. I always <laughs> listen to, hey, what, what is exactly what the artist, in the broadest sense of the word, uh, what is it that they want to get across to them? And yeah. that might be some that that might be related to, and this is an ongoing theme in my show is why you do see people coming from a punk or maybe even metal backgrounds are gravitating towards modular or maybe even modular music um, in general, where it's not necessarily about the production value or the um the delivery but it's more about the message and yeah. <clears throat> i think that that's something and, and and i've had people coming at this from all different uh points of view where we've had people who uh, well 100 agree with this uh people who uh, disagree with this but I'm interested to see what your point on that is. Uh, well, and specifically because you are not necessarily coming from from a punk or metal background, but more from a um, a grunge, early '90s, uh, evolving into garage uh, point of view, which doesn't necessarily identify with punk and or metal. Um, no, um, I mean, I guess, I mean, I had a little, I, there was some punk in there, but not too much, but I mean, coming from, I, I guess like, when I moved up here, I really, I really related with the experimental scene and the improv scene. Yeah. And I feel like improvisation really tell like, if you can do it well, you can say something. With you know, and it feels like it's in the moment, obviously, because it's mm-hmm. improv as opposed to yeah, a song absolutely. where it's like you rehearsed it, and this happens and that ha- you know, and so the the product becomes, or you know, like you're saying, like regardless of what it sounds like. I mean, I feel like you're saying the message. Um, if you can hone in 
your improv chops really well, it's really easy for you to be able to say the message in an adequate fashion, if that makes sense, where there's some people out there that say they, their message and, and keep saying it and then say it some more and they keep saying it. And, you know, yeah. like you need to know when, you know, in improv, you need to know when to say it and when to let someone else or maybe just, you know, help someone else say what they want to say and vice versa. So, um, I don't know if that's answering your question, but um, no, but uh, I think that, that is absolutely <laughs> on point little... where you might say that, now <laughs> where you say, well, from a, and this is again, I always want to relate it back to my personal limited uh, experience from a music production background. So the only thing that's I've, what, okay. I've no, but, but but to be honest, so the only thing I've ever done was um, do metal vocals for a metal band. Mm. And the thing is, is if you do that, then you are typically the sole... Well, uh, you are the sole well, projector of what kind of message you want to get across, right? And I feel that... When you are then working as a metal um, musician, as in a, a guitarist, a, a drum player, a percussionist, you are always in soul support of that message. And I, uh, yeah. have, the, I have the feeling that within modular um, electronic music, as opposed to well just generic electronic music uh where well the whole messaging is yeah just diluted by everything that's going on within the music industry where you might have the option within modular electronic music where you have the opportunity to deliver some sort of value-based message which is typically yeah. not based on on, 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 on on things like lyrics, but more on, hey, this is what we want to get across. Uh, whether it's based on, hey, I've got this idea on how to um, finally be able to achieve world peace. Or, hey, by the way, this is my thoughts on, or these are my thoughts on, well, X, Y, and Z. And... I think that that's a totally different approach to how you then, on the one hand, produce music, but also how you then uh, enjoy or experience music as well. And I think that that's one thing that I'm not quite sure of, of what that difference is and how we can then incorporate that into a sort of a best practice of... Um, producing modular modular music you might say well it seems like the whole modular thing is kind of a niche in itself right it kind of has an enclosed bubble so as opposed to like a bigger audience where you're kind of producing for you know what you would call the lowest common denominator i don't mm -hmm. i mean I, that sounds kind of insulting but i'm not saying it in a way but like you're you know it's a to fact produce, right that that's that's yeah, typically to, what to get the main yeah. you know you want to make the song to and i you know since i don't you know i don't think there's a lot of people with that mindset in this little area that we're in so you're getting it just kind of lends itself to you know just the way people record on the tape because tape's going to have a certain sound of medium you know so you're you're gonna you know you want it's lo-fi stuff just sounds good on tape you know so yeah it's going to lend itself to that kind of thing to where you're not going to be over polished because you can't because it's you know you but, can't over polish yeah. because it's all going to be on tape or like a no, late recording is, is, is it's that always going to have a certain characteristic but is then the, um, the the tape characteristic meant as a and now I'm I'm playing devil's advocate here and I I don't want to insult anyone with uh, with the statements that I'm about to make but is that whole approach of um, 
tape sound isn't that something like a gatekeeping mechanism or is that indeed something very pure and significant to well i hate the word scene but the whole demographic that we want to that we want to cater to you mean you talking about recording a tape or like just tape as no, like a, 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 bit, a, a bit a bit of both actually a bit a bit of both commodity? I mean, because I mean, tapes have become a more of a you know a, a hip commodity within this. Mm -hmm. I feel like you know because I feel like, but I feel like almost the modular scene almost kind of brought a resurgence back with. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Tapes, you know. Yeah. Um, so, but um, shoot, I forgot what I was saying before that. Now I'm starting to get spacey. Um, yeah, no worries. I think that's <laughs> Christian. Forgot. Christian uh, weighs in with a good point, um, and he says, "Well, it only gate keeps if you want it." Oh, to. the gatekeeping. Yeah, because you can always use a gate, the tape plug in as a replacement. Yeah, I, was gonna, I, yeah, I love no, that. I, don't think I, I think that's a great thing at all with that. Yeah, yeah, because I use tape plug saturation, you know. But I mean, I'm just thinking like, but. You know, an ultra or a hyper pop song is not going to sound like something that one yeah. of us is going to produce from this, you know, because we, I mean, because there's different aesthetics, but um, I think having it be a niche bubble, mm -hmm. you know, you don't, you know, you're not, there's no, there's not that big demand for the lowest common denominator, more or less. Um, no, so, then th this is becoming something for the, um, where you what where the the modular thing is catering towards a broader audience but where it's well it or we however you want to look at it is still um catering to the more the, the more purest um well people in the audience as well and I think that um, what Z4 he's he well, what they say is um, the more extreme music scenes are still using things like tape or cassettes. Um, mm -hmm. Personally, I can I can talk about the uh, the black metal scene uh, in the early nineties, uh, but even up until well right now, where um, cassettes are still well seem to be well one of the the mediums of choice where it's more like okay well this is something where we want to sh um wow differentiate us um as a sub scene as well and i'm trying to understand how that i i hate to use the word elitist approach but within black metal the whole elitist um denominator becomes a bit more relevant but how is that then translated into modular or maybe even uh I mean, electronic I don't... music as a, a as a whole are you i mean i i mean is this supposed to having elitist in the modular realm i mean well i don't think that um elitist has a place within modular i think that within the modular realm as i've come to know it is very acceptable and very open but there are specific musical um, or music scenes where elitists do well set the scene so to say yeah uh metal I mean, being I feel one like of them kind yeah of, i don't know if that's just part of the course there's always gonna there's just it's just there's always a lot of different types of characteristics to people and there's you know i feel like there's always going to be in uh, like one in every group <laughs> mm -hmm. in a way of speaking you know so yeah yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely so that's just how i take it um so um but i mean i just try to as far as what i put out i just try to if, as long as it's uh something that sounds sincere to me regardless of it's goofy or serious you know mm -hmm. as long as it sounds sincere that's the main thing to me it's you know um mm -hmm. and i do see a lot of sincerity like when you watch you know modular world of what jano puts on oh geez um, no yeah absolutely dude there's so many good freaking episodes of that show you know 
there's some really just banger stuff. I mean, and how many episodes he's on going on his second year, you know? So yeah, it's pretty cool to see that, you know? Um, well, and Jono is a great, great example of what he's, what is possible to achieve within the modular, um, yeah. let's say community. Um, yeah, he's even, a cool he, guy. Yeah, I'm no, he, he's looking he's, forward to meeting him. He's an exceptional guy, and what he's been able to do, and one of the things that I truly love about what he's done in relation to the um, uh, to the topics we were just discussing is there is no sense of elitism there. Uh, yeah. We have people just doing well ambient stuff. We've got people doing um, well purist 90 um elect electronic techno stuff and everything in between and all of them have been regarded with the same esteem so i think that that's something that is absolutely um spot on um yeah i, I mean that's what i kind of like about this scene because it does yeah. feel very community oriented because a lot of the times you're talking to those people in like the chat room you know or you know where like if there's someone I find interesting, I can just hit them up on Instagram. You know, you don't think twice about doing that mm -hmm. as opposed to these pop stars where it's like, you know, there's like all this separation, you know, you can't just, Hey, I'm going to hit this person up and expect yeah. them to, you know, not that I'm expecting everyone to respond to me, I'm, but you know what I mean? Like, it's it a very like open and, and, yeah, and, it's cool. and, it's like and accepting approach. Up. Yeah. Or hit a company up, you know I mean? I don't, to talk to UWM about what are you know, and then people, res it's just yeah, that's what I really dug about it, and that's oh, what kind of kind of kept my interest in it once once I got into it, and then, I mean, once Logan moved here and we had like Logan here, um, and then you know there was a cool little time where we were running some modular on the spots here and uh, a lot of stuff at Modular Addict, and so it was it was a lot of fun, um, and it being like all within the city here you know and yeah. um yeah so that's what i'm kind of excited about this summer it's like hopefully the, the covid thing is kind of done with and we can actually start i mean it's been fun i feel like there's been this huge swell with a lot of the streaming and stuff because of covid but <laughs> it would be nice to start doing this stuff in real life you know oh yeah and i'm finally from from a professional point of view I'm just starting to get out there again and I do hope to be able to um well to just go to certain events as well because for me um uh, modular has been part of my life for the last let's say year and a half and I finally want to act upon that and meet people um face to face as well um so maybe good uh, for people to know is that I'm still uh, planning to go to Superbooth on Friday and Saturday this year. And I just learned that we will have a modular meetup in Paradiso in Amsterdam this Saturday. I'm not quite sure if I'm able to make it, but it's always good to uh, to point that out. Yeah, I'd like to make it to Super Booth. Oh, That's, geez, yeah, absolutely. I was man, just about to that'd ask be awesome. You, yeah. No, um, yeah, doing Knobcon this year, but no Super Booth, obviously. Uh, it's easy for me to do Knobcon. It's because it's, it's right in Illinois. So, um, oh yeah, absolutely. But yeah, this one, like that, that the last one last year was the first one since COVID. So it was kind of smaller, but it was. It was fun meeting some people. I uh, met Travarsi and um, a lot of the other, uh, some of the other crew from LA was there. So uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, so yeah, I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to this year. So absolutely. Um, um, and hopefully next year I'll be able to uh, to make it to the US for Nopcon. Uh, oh, all, right it, on. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because I, I, I typically. I travel to the US a couple of times a year anyway. 
So I'll okay. try to, um, well, most of my family lives in the US and the UK, so I'll have to make sure that I can combine it then. Uh, but then again, also with my day job, I'll need to make sure that, well, we all need to align to something, right? So it's going to be yeah. fine. Um, but again, oh, geez, I, uh, John, I think I, I could just keep talking to you about all these things for a couple of more hours. Um, yeah, I, I kind of don't know when to stop talking about this <laughs> shit sometimes. Which is a great thing. Don't get me wrong. And I love, I love yeah. you for that. Um, but I do have to, um, well, it's almost, uh, it's almost midnight here. And um, I'll, I'll oh. have to start again tomorrow morning for my day job. Um, so gotcha. that being said, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure this is not the last time uh, the two of us uh, will have any sort of yeah, chat. Yeah, keep in touch. Uh, absolutely. And I, I, yeah, I do have to, to thank everyone because I've, I've truly loved the, the interaction on the companion channel uh, with all the feedback that we've gotten. Uh, so be that that having having sat yeah, back, thanks, guys. it's going to be absolutely fantastic. So Dees, uh, Miley, anyone else, Christian, uh, anyone else I'm now forgetting, uh, Z4, thanks so much for, uh, for chipping in. Um, just to let everyone in on some plans that we've got for the, well, I'm I'm working for a US based company, so everything that I do is quarterly based. So let's have a quick look at what we've got in store for everyone in the well next couple of weeks. Um if anyone is able to help me with uh, a couple of people I want to reach out to, uh just drop me a line. It's going it's gonna be great. Um uh, so we've got uh, a Schreif machine from Germany on April 26th. Then uh, later on, uh, we'll have uh, someone from Ike, uh, who are of course great at creating well, desktop synthesizers. Mm. Um, we'll have the, the product manager joining uh, at that time. And then the week after that, we'll have Super Booth so I'll uh, bring my well my phone with me and I'll try to film as much as I can. Then in May, um, I will be offline for a week, uh, the week commencing uh, Monday the 23rd up until the, well, let's say the, uh, the Sunday the 29th. And what I'd like to ask is, um, if anyone has any sort of connections to, um, well, let's say modular users like uh, Hans Zimmer um, or maybe even uh, JJ Abrams or um, people like that, let me know. If you've got people that have a great story to tell um, with the same ease, let me know because I'm always open to have a great discussion about modular, about synthesizers, about synthesis, about music creation, and whether the whole world knows of you, whether I'm the only one that knows of you, I'm here for you. So no worries. John McCoy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. You've um, you've shed a little light on the well, let's say the well, the music production world on how you design music, how you create music, and I do have to thank you for uh, on the one hand taking your time, uh, but also for your honesty. And as I said, this is not going to be the last time the two of us talk. So, uh, uh, well, right make on. sure make sure that we'll. Uh, going to continue doing this and let me know the next time you're in europe right gotcha no worries no worries anyone else listening to this either live or to the recording uh this has been a presentation of the modular clubhouse my name is jesper for now would say please everyone stay safe stay healthy 
and I hope to see you for my next show and or video. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thank you.